Okay, hello. This is a first time doing this. It's Kathy Pagano and I'm going to figure out how to get um, on Facebook Live as well. Live on Facebook. Okay. Okay, let's see what we can do. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to do both Zoom and Facebook Live. And in a minute, it will come on. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back to, um, I'm going to come back to this. Okay. So hi, everybody. I don't know who's here to join me, but welcome. Morris is going direct. It's Friday the 13th, the goddess's day. Um, Friday is Freya's day. Aphrodite, Venus, um, the goddess of love. The 13th is certainly the um, goddess number. And uh, this tonight, at about 7.30 Mar Eastern time, Mars went retrograde. I mean, Mars went direct in Aries. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm just trying to figure this out. Okay, people are still coming in. And uh, hello all. So this is something that I haven't done before. So it's gonna be like an interesting practice, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up um, my astrology chart and we'll begin with that. Let's see, move this over and okay. So this is today's chart. We're going to talk a little bit astrology and uh, this is today's chart. And um, this is when Mars went direct. And here's Mars right here. I have it set for um, Eastern time, but still in all it's here in Aries. And we can see that Air, Mars in Aries is, I'm gonna talk more about that, but it's in, it's in this red triangular aspect. It's squaring all of these Capricorn planets, which have caused so much trouble, okay? And it's so interesting, I just found an article Richard Kathy, Tarnas, Kathy, yeah. we can't see the chart. We can't see it. It says you disabled. Well, I can't see the chart. Okay, one second. Let's admit. Yeah, it's stopped sharing. It's paused. Okay, thank you. Screen sharing. Is it on now? Nope. Stop no. share. Stop share. Okay, we're going to work on this. Okay, let's try this. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. And somebody else came in, so I'm gonna to have to, um, I'm gonna go back here. Okay, uh, stop share. Let's find all the people who are coming in. Okay. So some of you hopefully are on Facebook Live and we're just gonna go on from here. Screen share, okay. So this is, um, we're talking about Mars. Mars has gone, um, has stationed. That means it's slowed down and stopped. Of course, we know that planets don't go backwards, okay? It's just as because of the way the Earth and the, and the planet happen to um, pass each other in their orbits. And so since September 9th, Earth has passed Mars, and so Mars looks like it's going backwards. And... Um, and now it's kind of stopped. We've gotten to the point where now Mars is going to say, no, I have to go ahead. So um, you can see that it's in a square. It's in a square relationship. That's a 90 degree angle, pretty much a little bit over to Pluto, Jupiter and Saturn in Capricorn. Those are the three planets in Capricorn that have really, you know, symbolized all the changes we've gone through this year. In January, Pluto and Saturn came together right around 23 degrees Capricorn. Yesterday, Jupiter and Pluto came together around 23 degrees Capricorn. So what that says to us is that we are entering a new phase in our society. And Mars is 
has been going backwards because we're trying to figure out how are we going to live in this new society? Are we going to continue doing things the same old way or do we want to do something different? And then here's the third aspect or the third leg of that triangle and it's Venus. Venus right now is in Libra. And so as you'll see when we talk a little bit about the myths, Mars and Mars, hello David, Mars and um, Venus always go together. And that's part of being part of the trouble with our Mars energy, with our masculine energy in the last couple hundred years at least, if not more. Mars has been disconnected from the feminine. And so we have this raging out of control um, Mars energy sometimes without the tempering love of Venus. And so the fact that the two of them right now are in this sort of intense energetic with the change planets says, are we going to change our ways and are we gonna invite Venus in whenever Mars is there? Okay. And you're going to see, as we look at some of the other charts later on, that um, America's progress chart is very much talking to that same thing, to that same aspect. So anyway, um, let's stop sharing for a minute. Okay, so welcome. I don't know if some of you are on Facebook Live. I've never done this, and I'm doing it myself. So we're working on it. Okay, so what we're doing tonight is talking a little bit about Mars. I don't know if you know the mythology behind Mars, but it began in ancient times. Um, people would look at the planet Mars and they considered it sort of an evil planet, the red planet. And interestingly enough, it's associated with plagues and war and destruction back in Sumerian times, back in Babylonian times. Um, in other cultures, he's been Nurgle, he's been different. Um, he was Aries for the Greek. And, and Mars for the Romans. And so Ares was an interesting war god because the Greeks didn't particularly like war, or at least they thought um, that they were more philosophical than that. Of course, the Spartans loved Ares, but Ares was kind of the war god who enjoyed it, who enjoyed having those conflicts. We have Pallas Athena, who's uh, sort of a warrior goddess, but she's more strategic. But Mars was very much a gung-ho, let's fight. Um, it's interesting, too, because his daughters were, some, um, some of his daughters were the Amazons, the women warriors. And of course, there's always been women warriors. It hasn't just been men. In ancient times, Venus or Aphrodite or Astarte or even Inanna, they were goddesses of war. And so it was war and love. And after a while, when patriarchy came in, that was split apart. And the feminine goddesses were the love part and the masculine gods were the war part. So we're, we're in this place right now where we have to really look at the masculine, the divine masculine and say, do we wanna continue having this Mars energy, just go ahead on its own without being connected to Venus or Aphrodite or love? Um, or are we gonna to start to combine it and bring it into some kind of a balance? In Greek mythology, Mars and Venus Mars and Aphrodite, who is the Greek uh, Venus, they were lovers. And one of the stories about them is that supposedly she was married off to Hephaestus, the god of volcanoes and artifacts. He was a great maker and shaper, um, but he was ugly and he had um, a, a gimpy leg and she was the most beautiful goddess of all. And so of course she went back to her old partner, Mars. So because Vulcan or Hephaestus who, which was the Greek name, because he was a tricky maker and he could, um, he could devise many things. He made this wonderful thin golden net and he caught them making love and he threw the net over them and they couldn't move. And all of the gods of Olympus came and sort of watched, um, looked at them and, and laughed, but also as Mercury or Hermes said, he'd rather be in there with her than out there looking at her. Um, of course, Aphrodite, as the goddess of love, got up afterwards and went and took her ritual bath and was virginal again, and she really couldn't have cared less. And Mars sort of was a little bit of an outcast. Uh, but he, he, you know, back at least in Greece, okay, was associated with the goddess. In Rome, not so much. Mars was originally a fertility god, 
And, um, and he also was supposedly the father of Romulus and Remus, the two babies that were raised by wolves and who became the founder of Rome. And because the Roman Empire, the Romans were much more interested in war, he was the second god behind Jupiter um, that they worshiped. And um, so we, we have this tradition down through the ages of the great warriors, okay? We have, um, we have Charlemagne and, and Roland, his, his major knight, and we have um, Hercules, and we have all of the Greek heroes. And um, all of them have to deal with women, but th that isn't a really important part of their story, if you will. And um, it's really through the Celts and the King Arthur stories that we begin to see how n being a knight or being a warrior is important for them to hook up with the divine feminine. So one of the stories um, that I want to tell is, uh, is a bit of a story about um, Sir Gawain. Now Sir Gawain was one of Arthur's knights before Lancelot came on, before Lancelot became the knight and he was really the knight of, of a woman's ideals you could say. Um, Sir Gawain was the knight, and he was the knight of the goddess. And he was Arthur's nephew, supposedly, by one of his sisters, either Morgays or Morgan. And from very early on, he was related to the goddess. He was one of her main supporters. But in the beginning, there was an interesting little story that I'm going to read you quickly. And it was about the first time that... Um, that Gwen was sent on a quest. So at the first gathering of the round table, after the wedding of Arthur and Guinevere, that's when Gwen was knighted. And on the same day began the quest of the white heart. Now heart was a, um, a stag. And, and so this white heart came into the hall in Camelot and he was pursued by a small hunting dog and by 30 hounds, black hounds. And the heart leapt over the table knocking over a knight, and then he was seized by this, um, and then he takes the dogs and he sort of, you know, wrestles with them and then he leaves. And so the next, a lady comes in and complains loudly that her dog has been taken away by this hound, and then Merlin declares that this is the first quest of the round table. And so Sir Gwen is sent off after the heart. And that's the, um, the white stag. Now in Celtic mythology, the white stag is always a symbol of going into the other world and the world of the goddess, the world of fairy. And so Gwen follows this heart and he comes and he has to fight a knight, which is often what happens. And um, Gwen finally beats him to the ground. And when the knight begs for mercy, um, Gwen isn't going to give him mercy. And he raises his sword and just then the knight's love, um, Lady Love comes and throws herself on the knight, and by mistake, Gwen. Um, hey, Kelly. Um, by mistake, Sir Gwen kills her and cuts off her head. Now, this is a big deal in Celtic mythology. There's a lot of heads that always are rolling around in Celtic mythology. We have Bran the Blessed, who was this magical um, king of Northern Wales, and he um, went and fought the Irish because they. Um, they um, victimized and hurt his sister who was married to the ki king over there and he was wounded and when he came back they cut off his head and he and his seven companions um, they sat with his head on a hill which is in London and they talked for 87 years they didn't even realize all that time had gone on so there was a thing with heads but it wasn't that the Celtic warriors were head hunters they thought that heads contained wisdom and so if you ever read any myths or stories about magical heads, it's because they thought that the head was the seed of the soul and the seed of wisdom. So if you look at this story, here he is, he's cutting off, he's hurting the feminine, but he also cuts off her head. And Queen Guinevere makes him carry that head around with him and go back. Um, well, one of the ladies he runs into sends him back to Camelot with the head. And Guinevere says, from now on, you have to serve women. And all through Gwen's mythologies, he's always dealing with magical fairy women and having to rescue them. 
Now, the main story about Gwen is one you might know. It's called um, The Marriage of Sir Gwen and Dame Ragnall. And I think that's a really interesting story to tell because one of the things that I think we need to do is we need to rebirth our masculine side. Men need to get it together and women have a masculine side as well called our animus. And as Jung would say, the animus is, okay, okay. The animus is the archetypal image of man that exists within every woman. woman. He's the hunter, the warrior, the statesman, the intellectual, the builder on both the material and mental planes. He's powerful and full of purpose. He possesses the keys to the laws by which life functions and the meaning behind the plan of its unfolding. He's related to mind and spirit and personifies objectivity, will, knowledge, direction, and impersonal perspective. He has a good side, a positive side, where his bright side is like the sun. And so the animus in a woman brings us clarity and illumination, purpose and strength. But he also has a dark side, which is the destroyer. And we see a lot of that right now. We see the negative toxic masculinity, which is so prevalent sometimes in our culture. And that's the dark side that destroys relationships and kills off feelings and brings about isolation. And so what we're really dealing with in many levels with Mars Going Direct is we need to get in touch with our inner masculine women and start to work differently with it. And for men, they have to get in touch with maybe their purpose and their power. So um, one of my favorite stories is the story of um, Dame Ragnall and um, Wayne. Now in all of these Arthurian legends, one of the things about them is they're like little, um, they're little teaching stories. They're, they're stories about the development through a culture of how people deal with both the masculine and the feminine. So one of the things back in the Celtic times is that they, the king had to marry the land and the land itself was called Lady Sovereignty because unlike some of the people we have ruling us today, not only in America, but all over the world, Back then, they knew that the king was there for the land. The king was there to protect the land and protect the people. That was the job of the king. And so in some of these stories, rather than having King Arthur be the one who goes out and does the um, heavy lifting, um, people like Sir Gawain take over and make, and, and sort of are part of, uh, become um, sort of surrogates for him. So this story is all about how do we recognize, okay, and how do we give sovereignty to the land? Because we are supposed to be stewards of the land. It's also about men giving sovereignty to women. So once upon a time, when King Arthur and his knights were out hunting, King Arthur took off after a stag, and after a while he lost, he went far beyond all of his men. And when he killed the stag, he was dressing it when suddenly a giant knight appeared. And he said, I've waited a long time to get you alone, Arthur. I'm going to kill you now. And Arthur said, well, that's not very knightly of you. I mean, where's your chivalry? Here I am. I'm just in my hunter's green. And there you are in your armor and with your sword and your spear. I don't think it's very fair that you would try to kill me right now. And so the knight said, okay, I guess um, you're right. So I'll tell you what. Um, I will give you a year to answer this question. And if you can solve the riddle, I will not kill you. But if you can't solve the riddle, then you're mine. And so Arthur said, okay, tell me what the riddle is. And the riddle is, what do women desire most? So Arthur went back and he was kind of upset because he wasn't quite sure where he'd find that answer. And he talked to his nephew, Gwen. And Gwen said, well, listen, let's go off and you go north, I'll go south. We'll go all over the kingdom and we will collect answers. We will ask everyone we know, we meet, what that answer might be. And so they took off. And they would meet people and some women said, we love to be fairly prayed or spoken to well. Others said, we wanna be really well arrayed. We want beautiful clothes. Some said um, women wanted to be taken care of and have security. So some people said one thing, other people said another. And Arthur and Gwen both ended up with two big books with answers. And when they got back to Camelot, Arthur looked through them all and he 
just felt in his heart they didn't have the right answer. So he drew, went into the forest and in the forest he heard uh, someone singing and he saw someone coming towards him. But as this person got closer and closer, he was horrified because she was the ugliest hag he had ever seen. She was riding gaily on a beautiful horse and singing, but her breasts hung down to her waist and she had boar's tusks that came up and she was the ugliest hag that you could ever imagine. But she was quite gay and she yelled and she called out to him and said, Arthur, I am here to tell you that you don't have the answer. And if you don't listen to me and give me what I want, you'll most likely die. And Arthur said, well, what do you mean? And she said, I'm the only one who knows the answer. And if you want it, you have to give me what I want. So he said, well, what do you want? And she said, I want to marry your beautiful nephew, Sir Gwain. And Arthur said, I can't promise you that. And she said, well, if you don't promise, if he doesn't marry me, then I'm not going to tell you the answer. So Arthur said, okay, I'll go back and talk to him. And when he did, of course, his nephew said, look, I would rather die than have you not, you know, beheaded. So of course I'll marry this ugly hag. So off Arthur went again into the forest and there was the ugly hag. And she said, my name is Dame Ragnall. And I will tell you that what women want both high and low is to have the sovereignty. Now, Arthur went back after a year to that Forest Glen and there was the giant knight. And he went through those two books because he was not going to tell him that answer from Dame Ragnall if he could help it. Um, but finally, the knight said, look, Arthur, you don't have the answer. It's not in your books. So finally, Arthur said, well, I have one more answer. What women desire most is to have the sovereignty. And then I threw up his hands and said, my sister Ragnall has told you the answer. Arr, I can't kill you. And off he went. So Arthur was saved and he was heading back to Camelot and who should come riding along was Dame Ragnall with her big boar's teeth and her ugly face, but her happy attitude. And she said, this is great. Let's go home. I want to go get married. And he was surprised. He said, what do you mean right now? And she goes, yeah, right now, let's go back to Camelot. So off they go and they get to Camelot. And of course, Gwen is everybody's favorite, especially the women, since he's the knight of the goddess. And they couldn't believe that he was going to marry this ugly hag, but he was, see, Gwen, what happens is that the knights, they have the honor and courtesy and patience. They're, they have these virtues that they live by. And he went up to her and helped her down off her horse as if she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. And she said, oh, I wish I were beautiful just for you. You're so kind and generous. But anyway, she said, let's go. I want to get married. And Guinevere tried to sort of push her off into a little chapel. But she said, nope, I want to get married in the cathedral in front of everyone. And so Gwen did. He married her. And they went back and they had a big feast and she drank barrels of wine and, and beer and ate a whole um, roasted boar all by herself and licked her chops and everybody went, oh my goodness, what will happen to Gwen tonight when she gets a hold of him? We might never see him again. Um, but he was courteous until they got to their bedroom. And they were getting ready for bed and he couldn't bring himself to look at her and he turned away and she said, wait, what's this? Please, you're supposed to be my husband. At least give me a kiss, at least for Arthur's sake. And so getting all of his courage together, he turned around and he said, I will do more than that. And he turned around and he was so surprised because she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, even more beautiful than Guinevere. And he said, who are you? And she said, I'm your wife. What do you mean? He said, but you're not ugly. And she said, well, this is who I am. And so they made love. And afterwards, she said, now, Gwen, I have to tell you, my beauty will not hold. I can be beautiful only part of the day. So would you rather have me beautiful in the daytime in front of all your friends or ugly at night? Okay. Someone's, someone's telling me that it's not going on Facebook Live. But anyway. Uh, or do you want to be, so do you want me to be beautiful in the day and ugly for you at night or ugly in the day and beautiful here in bed with you? And Gwen said to her, you know, that would be hard. I want everybody to see how beautiful you are, but I certainly don't want 
to go to bed with the ugly side of you. And then he sat and he thought, and finally he looked at her and he said, you know what? I'm not the one who should make this choice. This is about you. So you choose when you want to be beautiful. And she kissed him and said, you are the best night in the world because you've broken the spell. Now I can beautiful, be beautiful both day and night because you have given me the sovereignty. And that's the marriage of Sir um, Gwen and Dame Ragnall. So here's this night, this night of King Arthur's round table, who once again had to go on that quest, okay? Because these things keep getting lost, okay? Our society can't quite hold on to some of these um, really important issues, like how does the masculine and the feminine come together? And how do we take care of the earth that we live on? And so this was an initiation. And it's about how, if you're gonna be a warrior, you need to be connected to the divine feminine. You need to have a reason for going to war, okay? And it can't be going to war for business, okay? For corporations as we do today, for greed, we can't be going out, but the reason that King Arthur and his knights went to war was because they defended their land. And that's where Mars is heading right now. We need to have our Mars be the protector. We need our Mars to be the defender of life, like the green man in Celtic mythology. We need, it to, we need Mars to be in service to life. Now, some of the things that we could say about, um, about Mars and Aries, they, they're very much the same in many ways. Mars doesn't go... Um, Mars doesn't go retro, Mars goes retrograde every two years, okay? But very rarely does it go in Aries, which it rules. And Aries is a beginning energy. So we have new beginnings. Aries is in from March 20th or so to April 20th. So it's the beginning of spring. Aries is that new impulse of life. It's the returning light. So when anything is in Aries, we say, oh, this is a new energy. This is what, this is an energy we have to birth. If you know your astrology chart, wherever Aries is in your chart, it tells us a bit about um, where life starts for you. So if Aries is in the fourth house, which is your home, then that's where you put your, that's where your, the spark of life and the inspiration is for you. If it's in the 10th house, it's, it's work. If, it's in the, if Aries is in the 7th house, it's partnerships. So wherever your Aries is in your chart, that's where life comes alive for you as if it's spring. So we have that energy, the Aries energy. And then we have Mars, okay? And some of the positive um, aspects of, um, well, let's look at Aries first. Aries is all about being adventurous, spontaneous, pioneering, okay? It's courageous and enthusiastic. It's assertive and confident. And its goal is to achieve something and maybe be a leader. So here we are with this energy that says, let's go on an adventure and Mars is there. And Mars says, sure. Now you can also have the negative qualities of Aries, which you can read about, but that's being impulsive and impatient and sort of foolhardy and selfish and quarrelsome or argumentative and competitive, egotistical, okay, and ruthless. And those are the energies of toxic masculinity, if you will. So Mars, Mars has many of those same qualities. But Mars's energy is the yang energy of life. So we don't have to put a negative on it. Some of the old astrologers said Mars and Saturn are negative, malefic planets. Energies can't be negative or positive. They're just neutral. So when you have an energy like Mars, it's how you meet it. Okay, if you meet it in a positive, confident way, then Mars energy will be Outgoing, it will be about passion and desire. Mars is eros. It's our, it's our energy for life. It's our libido. It's our sexuality. It's where we, we desire something and we go after it. 
And maybe it's because um, our culture has put so much emphasis on competition and on um, uh, my, my brain, it's nine o'clock, um, accumulating things, okay, on money, okay, on power, on domination. Mars has been like that. But now that it's been retrograde all of these months since September, it's been sort of held back and pushed inside. Hopefully now that it's turned direct, we can say, are those really the things my heart desires? Is that really what I want? I mean, it doesn't take as much money as we think to live. It feels like it does. But now that we've been stuck inside with COVID, how much money do we really need? Okay. How much power and domination over other people? Is it really that much fun? Or do we want to do something else with our Mars Yang energy? Do we want to stand up for what's right? Do we want to protect those that need us? Do we want to, um, do we want to stand up and say, this is who I am and this is what I want? And that certainly goes with the divine feminine. The divine feminine says, listen to your heart. Listen to what, um, what needs to, what you, what you came into this lifetime for and use your Mars energy to go get it. And that's the gift I think we've been given this year. We've been given this gift of having the world stop. Mother Earth sent us to our rooms and said, think about things, you've been bad or naughty at least. Um, and think about what life could be like. What would happen if we just stopped wanting to be powerful or be famous or make a gazillion dollars? This is my own prejudice, but when that movie, The, the Secret, came out years ago, I thought, everybody wants to imagine that they're millionaires. And of course, I certainly did too at certain points. But that's not what this kind of intention is. That not intentional magic is not for that. Intentional magic is to help the world. Most magicians yeah. would study for 20 years, and then they would never do magic for themselves. And so if we're going to get into the quantum field and start playing around, yes, we could send out intentions for our life to be better. But is it really about intentions for our life to be better? Or just do we want to have another car or some more money or whatever? Mm -hmm. So this is the moment and this is the time when we really have to discern what is really important in our life. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I talked a little bit about this in my newsletter, but um, there's some Jungian therapists who have written a book called, um, where the heck is it? One second. Okay. There's um, two men who wrote a book called The King, The Warrior, the Magician, and Lover. Roger, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. Okay, I'm not quite getting it, I don't think. It's not showing. But anyway, you know, it's, it's a book about the four basic archetypal patterns of the masculine. Four is a very grounded number. It's like the four directions. Mm -hmm. And so um, the king can be many things. We can talk, you know, you can um, riff it from there, but um, the warrior, the magician, and the lover, those are the four main archetypes that um, you could play around with men and, um, or the masculine. And the king is the spirit and it's fire. And it's how we generate life and, um, and give it order. The feminine is the basis of life, okay? It's the material we work with. It's our intuition, it's our imagination, it's our feelings but it's the masculine focus, laser focus and willpower and intention that make it so. So like Captain Picard on the spaceship Enterprise, he'll say, number one, what do you think? And then he'll turn to Deanna Troy, the counselor, who's an empath and say, counselor Troy, what do you feel? And then he makes decisions, a very balanced ego. That's why we all love him. Um, so anyway, um, the king brings order. Okay, to us, besides generating fertility and blessings. And um, the king, in a way, has to be all of them. He has to be the lover, the warrior, and the magician. 
And one of the things about kings is they mediate heaven and earth. And before the gods, they represent the people. And before the people, they represent the gods. And so they are willing to sacrifice themselves. They are willing to die for the people. That's an important point. Not that we literally have to die, but maybe we need to, our expectations of what we need in life need to die so that we can birth a new society that is more sustainable. Okay. Then you have the warrior who's more earthy and embodied, and he's like the athlete, and he trains and he hones his, um, you know, one of the things with, with Aries and with Mars too is it's about assertion and aggression and competition. It's that need to grapple with life, the need to go out and have action. It's our doing energy. And the warrior certainly is an example of that. And, um, but it's about self-discipline. The warrior has great self-discipline. And, um, and the biggest thing is that he takes responsibility for his actions. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people who don't want to take responsibility for their actions today. And we're seeing a lot of people who don't want to give up things, okay? Not even to wear a mask. If you're really free, asking, somebody asking you to do something for other people doesn't take away your freedom. It's only when you're not free that you feel those little things. So part of our job with Mars Going Direct is we need to find our freedom. It's time. And that means being your own authority, understanding that life isn't a fairy tale. Um, in terms of everything's always going to be good. I think a lot of us in America, especially my generation, I'm one of the baby boomers, um, we were brought up thinking everything's going to be wonderful. Well, it isn't. Okay. Part of coming to, into life, into this earthy life, is we go through initiations. We have to meet what comes to us and it's how we meet it that makes all the difference. Just like energy, our experiences are neither positive nor, or negative. They just are. It's how we meet them and embrace them that makes them positive or negative. And I'm not saying getting sick isn't a negative, but it's how we meet it, okay? Um, the other two archetypes are the magician, which is mind in air more, and it's about how we look for knowledge. And of course, the lover, which is water and um, art, the art of, of embracing all of life. So we have this energy, this Mars energy that wants to be renewed. We have this Mars energy that needs to be attached to the divine feminine. And let me get it on screen here. So this is the thing I wanted to show you, which I find fascinating. So every, every um, country has a birth chart. And this is one of our birth charts. Oops. Okay. So this is, this is the birth chart of America, the 4th of July. There's, very, there's a few different birth charts depending on times. And my friend Carolyn Casey is a magnificent wow. astrologer and just an all-around crazy coyote oh. trickster. Um, yep. she, she looked at the, um, at the $100 bill on the back of it. And on the clock tower, she thought that it said 2.25 p.m. And she figured... Since the founders and the people who wrote the Constitution and the uh, and the and um, the the Fourth of July Declaration of Independence, um, they were all, um, if not occultists, at least they were Masons and they knew astrology. They knew things. She figured that maybe it was um, two twenty-five rather than five ten, um, as the time that we use for the Sibley chart. But anyway, either way, okay. Here's America, we have cancer, we have a lot of cancer, we take care of everybody, um, we're a little scattered, we have Uranus and Mars in, in um, Gemini, so we're always doing a million things, um, but we have Chiron in Aries, and so there's a wound, Chiron is the wounded healer, it's the wound to um, our identity, we're not quite sure who we are. And so one of the things you can do with any kind of chart, your birthday chart or whatever, is you can progress it. For every day after you were born, we say it's a year. And this shows us how we change and grow through life. So this is America's progress chart right now. 
And the interesting thing is, if you look at it, not wrong one. If you look at it, in in a in a country's chart, the moon represents the people. And so we have right here, this is the progress chart to today, okay? Or November 12th. Don't ask me why it keeps going to November 12th, but it does. Um, the progressed moon, which travels a degree every day, is right next to Pluto in Capricorn. So basically it's saying, as a culture, as a country, we're going through a death. We're going through a death of our beliefs in ourselves. We're going through the death of our power. We are, we are at the end of empire. We're about to have our Pluto return in another year or two, which is always the end of empire for a country. But right now, right at this moment, the people, we the people are experiencing that death. We're seeing that our culture has, hasn't worked for us. We're seeing that our culture is a corporate culture, that our Supreme Court votes for laws that, su that support corporations more than they support people. Yep. Just like people who got upset about the rioting or were more concerned about buildings than about the fact that black people are being killed. Okay, we, we, we have a, a myth that says we're the land of the free and the home of the brave, but we're not, okay? We're not the equal people, at least that I was brought up with. And so right now, by progression, all Americans in some way are feeling the pain of this death right here. Yep. Okay. So the other thing that's interesting is, um, I'm trying to find all the different things. Okay, let's where do, can I move this someplace else? Okay. So anyway, by progression, Mars, is retrograde in Libra, okay? Back when we were born in 1776 as a country, it was in Gemini, but right now it's in Libra, okay? And exactly across from it is the is Chiron. Chiron is an asteroid, it's called the Wounded Healer. Chiron was a centaur who taught the heroes their destiny. And in astrology, we say it's kind of an existential wound. And when America was born, Chiron was in Aries. So this is a cultural wound. Who are we, right? So we get here, we're all from different countries. None of us have the thousands or hundreds and hundreds of years of roots that if you're Italian and you live in Italy, or if you're English and you live in England, or if you're French and you live in France, or if you're Indian and you live in India or Africa, <coughs> we're all these displaced children Back when I lived in um, Vegas, we would have Orphans Thanksgiving for all the displaced people who came to live in Las Vegas, <laughs> okay? And that's who we are. It's like we're all orphans. We're not rooted. If you look at some of the Native American writings like Chief Joseph, I think it was, or maybe Chief Seattle saying, until you, your bones, until the bones of your ancestor are buried in this earth, you won't know that this is your land. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there's so many great warriors. One of my favorite is Geronimo. He was an Apache. And I always thought, I'm an Apache. If I was initiated into an Apache tribe, as a matter of fact, once in a meditation. And, um, you know, he just never gave up. They tried to put him in a reservation and he, got, he escaped. He took people with him until he was older. And then they finally sent him to Florida away from southern arizona and new mexico where his lands were in mexico too you know and and this is part of being a warrior you know a grounded warrior it's like these are my people this is my land i need to be free well that's one of our jobs isn't it we need to learn to be free and with this mars here and chiron here and then if we superimpose this mars retrograde that we're coming out of right now Mars is right here. It's almost right on this Chiron. It's right here in Aries. Okay. So we have this, this opportunity as a country to heal our Mars, to heal our toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. And without offending too many people, but I'm sure I will, we are seeing such a big 70 million people's worth of toxic masculinity. You know? Yep. 
one of the and things that disappointed me so much was that people could vote for someone who was such a morally depraved character. They didn't care about character. They didn't care that someone could like that, you know, could run things, let alone destroy the environment and do every, all the other bad things that he did. But the thing that hurt me, my heart was that they couldn't see that not having any kind of moral values was an important thing to have. Yep. Uh, besides all the other nasty, rotten, hateful things this man did. So here's the issue for us right now. Can we heal our toxic masculinity mm. as a country? Mm. Now, Mars is in Libra, which is ruled by Venus. So mm. by progression, okay, America's Mars is trying to come into some kind of balance with uh, inequality with mm. the goddess, with the mm. feminine, okay? Mm -hmm but it has to heal its identity. We have to figure out who we are. Ooh. Ooh. And I think that part of America's trouble is that we go, oh, you're Italian and you're Indian and you're Vietnamese and you're Afro-American and you're this and that. And we're not, no, as much as we say we're Americans, we keep splitting everybody up. And every, every group of people, immigrants who came here were, were picked on, every group and name called and, and dished and everything. And now here we are at this defining moment in many ways when we, I, I'll show you in a minute why it's a defining moment as well. This, the whole, the whole point of our collective story is can we heal the masculine? Mm. Women, we women, we have worked our asses off for the last 50 years to get conscious. As a therapist, I have dealt with so many women and they just want to kill their men because the men aren't doing the work. Not that all men don't do the work, but it's like, it's, it's like dragging, you know, you know, pulling teeth until it's too late and everybody leaves and says, I'm divorced. And then the men go, oh, I'm sorry. No, get your act together. And it's so interesting because women know, knew that we weren't free. And so we said, we're going to break the chains and get free. I don't think men realize as much that they aren't free either. And maybe this is the moment that they can go, you know what? I'm not free. I'm not free of patriarchal expectations. I'm not free of thinking that this is the only way to be a man. Mm. That, I'm, you know, if I'm not a man in a certain way, I'm less than. Mm. Um, and so this is a great moment for us, I hope and I think. Um, right now, Pluto, okay, and all of those three planets are pretty much right here on the south node, the progressed south node of America, which is, you know what? All right. Being the father, you know, being, you know, concerned about um, the corporations and the power structures, that's the old. That has to go. We have to start <clears throat> nurturing everybody. We have to take care of the poor and the sick and the elderly and the children we have to go into the collective unconscious all the things that as a nation we've rejected and i really believe america is the ones we have to do it we have to do it so the rest of the world knows how to do it too okay an example so here we are example. you know here we are in this in the midst of this tremendous change and so here's the next change that's coming and this is why it gives me hope um, in on December 21st, winter solstice of this year. Um, let me get some things up. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to take you back to this Mars direct. These three planets right here in Capricorn, Pluto, Jupiter, and Saturn, they've all started three new cycles. Every time two planets come together, they start a new cycle. Okay. Um, as Richard Tarnas said, when Pluto and Saturn come together, what happens sometimes is that people project the shadow onto other people. You're the bad people. We've seen so much projection going on this year. <laughs> okay? People don't, you know, there's a certain group of people who don't want to look at their shadow, okay? And when you don't look at your own self, your own shadow, you throw it out on other people. Um, Jupiter and Pluto just came together for the third and last time in Capricorn um, just yesterday. 
And it's really about what's the new vision we want. Jupiter is all about expansive vision. Um, he says, let's go, let's make things bigger. Let's give you opportunities. What are the possibilities? And Pluto is the cauldron of death and rebirth. So we have um, Pluto saying to Jupiter, what do you want? Because let's put it in my cauldron and birth it. Now Saturn's already moving out, but here we have these three planets. And Jupiter and Saturn are gonna hook up. They're gonna hook up on December 21st which I didn't bring up. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna look for it right now, but on winter solstice, Jupiter and Saturn are gonna come together in, at the beginning of Aquarius, at about one degree Aquarius. Every 20 years, Jupiter and Saturn come together. They're the social planets, and they have been in Earth signs for the last 200 years. So basically, they set up the parameters of society. So for the last two or hundred years or so, it's all been about materialism. It's been about the earth. But because we don't give, we don't see the earth as full of spirit, because we have this patriarchal bias, this Christian, Judeo-Christian, Islamic, whatever bias that the earth is dead and we can do anything we want with it. Yeah. Um, you know, we've fallen into like the depths, you know, uh, what was it called? If anyone ever saw that movie Labyrinth with the um, David Bowie and all the Muppets, the bog of stench, we've gone into the bog of stench. Um, and, you know, down into nothing is real. The material world is all there is. But now for the first time since 1200, around 1220, we're gonna have these two planets come together in air signs for the next 200 years. Yowie. And that means that the society is gonna be based on how we connect to each other, what our ideals are, how we um, see ourselves as a people. It's gonna be more about ideas than about the material plane. And there's the quantum field right there, okay? So, so that's exciting and it's going to change, but look at this. And no, 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 we don't want to get rid of it. Um, look at this. On March, on December 21st, 2020, this is America's progress chart. America's moon is going to be at zero, at zero degrees, whatever, one degree Aquarius. So as Jupiter and, Plu and um, Saturn today in this, year come together at one degree Aquarius, America's people are going to jump on the Aquarian train. That doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out really good all of a sudden and everything's going to be fine and dandy, but our mindset is going to be there. We're going to be focused on the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that gives me hope. Yeah. Once again, we have to heal the masculine. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. It's my favorite book. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I think you all should read it. But um, it's a story about, um, it's a story called by Guy Gabriel Kay. And it's called the summer, tree. it's called the Finnivore Tapestry. There's three books. And it's the summer tree and the wandering fire and the darkest road. And what it is, is Guy Gabriel Kay worked on Tol Tolkien's, you know, Lord of the Ring Tolkien, his books after he died. Him and Tolkien's son, Christopher Tolkien, edited The Similarian and a lot of books. So he really dove into Tolkien's world. But this is, so this is a similar story, but a very different story. And in it, five people from our time and our world are taken back to the first world, to like the original world, Finnevar. And there's three men and there's two women that go back with this magician. And there's something, they're going back like for a celebration, except that there's something wrong with the land. A thousands and thousands of years ago, there was an evil one there who tried to kill everybody and take over, and they imprisoned him under a mountain. The dwarves, the elves, mankind, the wizards, everybody. But something's happening to the land. It's kind of dying. 
So it's interesting that these five people, young people go back, they're young, they're in their 20s, they're all at college um, or grad school. And one of the men is sort of a big athletic guy who was brought up by a father who always picked on him, told him he was no good. He didn't feel like he had any family. And when they get over, when they go and cross over to this magical land, he loses his way. He, he did, gets disconnected. And he ends up with a tribe of people very much like Native Americans, where he learns to be a warrior. He's a big guy, so he's a warrior. And he changes. He's with these wonderful people on the plains with horses, and he becomes a warrior. The second guy who goes over is has been kind of upset because his lover died in a car crash that he was driving in. And um, I won't tell you what happens or why, but so he's kind of depressed. And the king of the land is old and the land is dying. And when the king, when the land is dying, the king is supposed to sacrifice himself, but he won't. And so this young man, Paul says, I'll sacrifice myself. I'll be the sacrifice. And they hang him on the summer tree. And he hangs there until he rede is redeemed and he comes back as a power. But he's willing to sacrifice himself. He didn't think he'd make it through. He thought he would be dead, but he didn't. And he comes back with power. The third guy is sort of the lover. He's just wonderful. And, he, and in, in many ways, he doesn't feel like he has much to offer. But at some point, when the evil one escapes the mountain and starts to like really wreck the land, he offers himself as a sacrifice and he brings back spring. And there are two princes in that land. One is a great lover and one is just the king and a soldier. And they do things that they sacrifice for. And the two women become, one becomes a seer and one becomes, this is a, I'm sorry, but one is Guinevere. And they call back Arthur, who has to come back in fighting battles because he killed the children. When he went after Mordred, he killed innocent children. So it's his fate. He never gets to sleep. He always has to come back. So here he is. He's there with Guinevere, and he's willing to die. And then, of course, Lancelot has to come back into the picture, too. So here are all of these amazing men and amazing women. And the thing that the men do is they protect and defend and are willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of the land and the good of the people. So I suggest if you like fantasy to go and buy it, Guy Gabriel Kay and read the book. But it's a story about what men are here for and what men can do. And women can do it too. We have the masculine within us too. But it's so important that we start to have some ideals it's so important that we say, yes, I am honorable. Yes, I am loyal. Yes, I have, I'm virtuous. Not that you don't, I'm not talking about chastity where you don't have sex, but that you live your virtues out. Um, and that is a part of the masculine. And that's in women too. We're honorable, we're all of those things. But there are these two energies in the world. And although we want to mush them together and say that they're the same, they're not. One is a being energy, the feminine. One is a doing energy, the masculine, yin and yang. And we need to bring them back together in a whole new form. And that's what this, that's what, um, let's see. Okay, that's not it. But that's what this um, Mars retrograde, Mars direct, Here's Mars and here's Venus. And oppositions are really complementary. We tend to pull them apart, but it, no, but there are two sides of one coin. And so Venus and Libra, okay, Venus rules Libra. Venus is all about love and beauty and grace and connection and attraction, okay? Mars is about passion and desire and protection. And Mars in Aries says, this is what I'm here for. This is what I was born for. And Venus in Libra says, I will take you 
into my arms and I will love you and I will stand to opposite you and I will demand that you do better than you've done before. So anyway, that's what I think is going on. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other stories they'd like to tell. Um, but Kathy, can I yeah. jump in? Of this course you can. <laughs> I wanted you to possibly speak on the blessing of Mars moving through and completed now, um, moving through all 12 expressions of the masculine and renewing that so that now we can go forward and practice 12 new expressions of the masculine going forward. Yes. Well, and the thing is, each person has their Mars in a different place. So, of course, the Mars in the, in the Earth signs are going to are going to be the ones who defend the earth, I think. Okay, the, the warriors of the earth. The Mars in the fire, you know, are, it's all about the inspiration and the creativity. The Mars in the water is all about the lover. It's all about that um, being emotionally in touch with their own emotions, their own inner being. And then the air Mars are the wizards, if you will. Um, I don't have the whole wheel, and that would be a good thing, but I didn't to that. I didn't go through each of the different signs. Um, this was much more of a freewheeling kind of thing. But well, I was thinking for the social collective and what Jupiter and Saturn are coming together to do and help us kind of dial that in it, maybe just a little bit of an intention of calling in that higher masculine expression through everyone, through men yeah. and women. Well, I think that the highest expression we can call on is that we become stewards of the earth that our thinking, our feelings, our inspiration, and our, do, and our concrete doing and building are all geared towards realigning ourselves with the biosphere of Mother Earth. We used to be part of Earth's biosphere and we separated out. We, took, we were taken out and dumped, okay, on the sidelines. And now with so many people that don't go to their old religions, that aren't going to churches or temples or whatever's, um, that we need to have a belief system in some ways. And I think that the highest expression right now of Mars is um, like Sir Gwaine, that's why I brought it up, um, giving sovereignty to the earth, which means that all of our doing, okay, needs to be geared towards how do we begin to heal the earth? Mm -hmm. How do we begin to heal our place in the earth? How do we begin to heal our relationship with each other and with the cosmos? I don't know. What do you think, Kelly? I think it's time to renew our relationship with the earth. It's not a thing. It's an alive being, you know, and that requires relationship. That's not, yeah. you know, we don't get to stomp on it. It's real. No. So renewing that. And I think that because Western culture hasn't tra been trained that way, there's going to be a lot of room for learning and practice and there is no perfection, but let's at least move in the right direction, you know, Definitely. and I think that is yeah. another thing we're calling in with the, the new air signs with Jupiter, uh, Saturn. Uh, I feel like is where the value is going to be more in the information and technology and where they've already pillaged the earth. Okay. So maybe they're going to shift their attention now to more air things, but I also think the air signs bring in the human side and the consciousness and the, and the humanity, the dynamic between us. And you might wanna just add in there about Venus and her, her deal with raising the consciousness every time she goes backwards in Gemini. Every time she does that, it, our, our social collective realms uptick a little bit. Yes. They raise, everybody wakes up to something. <laughs> yes, definitely. And the, you know. And Kelly's great with the Venus cycle. She's a great astrologer, a great shamanistic astrologer. And my friend. I know, and I'm trying to get her to play with me with Mars and Venus together. <laughs> oh, as you see the picture, this is a picture I took of the full moon at Narragansett Beach when I first moved back to Rhode Island. It must I have love been that a, one. in the winter. But it's just, uh, it formed a grail. And that, to me, is the divine feminine. Like, what is... Who, you know, when you go on the Grail Quest, which Sir Gwaine certainly went on along with a few others, um, the question is, who does the Grail serve? And the Grail doesn't just serve 
people. It serves our two, our four-legged relations. It serves Mother Earth. It serves everyone. And um, we have the wasteland. We are living in the wasteland. That's why these Arthurian legends are still so pertinent. We're living in a wasteland um, where, where we have a president who's just signing some, who just got our EPA to make some laws that will be, make it harder for us to stop corporations if they're polluting. Who does that? You know, what kind of person would, would, would harm the earth on purpose for profits? And that's where we live today. That's that Pluto and the moon and at the end of Capricorn. Um, those kind of, of, that kind of thinking just, and, and feeling and being is just is on its way out. Um, we have a lot of movies and, and other things that speak to this. Um, Avatar is of course one. You know, the wounded warrior who becomes the, um, who re reclaims his connection to, if not our earth, um, Pandora's earth, and, um, and becomes the protector of it. Um, we have the Lord of the Rings, Aragorn, my favorite um, king, who's willing to die, who's willing to, to not be recognized, the hidden king who protects and defends the land. Um, we have... Um, I, Would you I was, consider I Black this, Panther? We have Black Panther. That's the next one I was going to say. We have the Black Panther. There's so many fairy tales and stories about women getting our power but we need to have stories about men reclaiming their power as well. So important. Yes. I put it in my newsletter. It's kind of a funny little show, but there's a show called Cobra Kai, and it's based on the old karate kid. And it's about the blonde kid who, who the little funny Ralphie, you know, dark haired guy and Mr. Miyati, um, who he defeated. And they're, and now they're in their forties and you know, the Mr. Miyati's guy is successful and the other guy isn't. And they both start training students. But it's really a story of redemption that the kind of bad guy realizes that it was bad and his teacher was bad. And, 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 he, and he starts to train these kids and he's kind of rough on them. And then he learns that that's not the way to be. So it's a very interesting story of, of a warrior who you know, began not so great, <laughs> and who slowly but surely is coming into the realization that kicking ass and being tough isn't the be all and end all of life. Um, so just a funny little story, you know, nothing great, but interesting. Um, so there's, you know, whatever, I don't know, are there other people who have stories? Because I think it's important, we need stories to inspire us. Kathy, what about your dreams? Have you had any dreams you'd want to share along these lines? No, I haven't. <laughs> we, as, we as human beings have lost our touch with Pachamama, Mother Earth. We don't touch the ground. We don't walk on her with the bare feet. We don't honor the trees, the four-legged and the winged ones that are out there every single day that we can walk out there and, and talk to them. And, and Brother, uh, Brother Wind and uh, Father Sky and everything else, we, we, we got so involved in this world with all these mechanical stuff that's going on around us that we become so materialized that we forgot to, to be able to get in touch with Mother Earth, you know, and that's a daily kind of thing um, that I tend to do by working in the garden and, and uh, talking to the bugs in my garden. Yep. We need to get back in touch with uh, those things that were given to us by Mother and Father Sky, you know? Definitely, definitely. You know? The beauty and, uh, of the earth. When I was young, I used to just go out and like talk to the crocuses and the flowers. And some of my dreams throughout, for not recently, but a long time ago, in my dream, I would just come upon a group of flowers that just glowed with magic and beauty. And the whole dream was me op there with my heart open, looking at these magical flowers. Our connection to our, our, our animal guides and friends are just amazing. This summer, I was so blessed because my eyesight isn't as good as my daughter's. And when we walk, she points out birds in the trees and I can't see them. But over my car, only about 20 feet above me, two golden eagles. 
flying oh, so low and they oh, went back oh, and wow. forth. I stopped my car right in the road and they oh. just went back and forth over me. And, and your heart just opens. When we connect with nature, our hearts open and we become like the divine children we were meant to be. And that's what Mars has to get back to. That openness, that childlikeness, that that sense that uh, of passion. Mars is Eros, the god of desire. Okay, and um, we have we have so stuffed our desires. That's why we have so many people who are addicts. Okay, as I love to say, as Jungians say, alcohol is spirits. Drugs take us into the spiritual world. People do drugs and drink because this world is not what they are comfortable with and they want to go away. They want to go into that other place. And we need to bring spirit back in. We need to teach our children and our friends that the earth is still alive and still full of magic and still full of power. And if we work with her, we can heal the earth. If you've seen the movie, Kiss the Ground, it's all about a type of farming in which we can capture all the CO2. If we stop the farming, the collective, those big awful corporate farms that we have in the middle of the country that are killing our soil. Yeah, if you want to see an interesting movie, My Octopus Teacher. Oh my God, I love that. Yes, I saw it. <laughs> Okay, the animals are so conscious. Every t now I notice octopus at the at the fish yeah, market, and smart, I go, hey, "They're a smart mammal." Octopus. These octopus are very smart. They're so, so smart. I think they're 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 the smartest thing there is out there. They're they have so a smart. lot of intelligence. And so do um, so do is it scallops or? Cal what are calamari? Oh, they're, they're delicious with garlic. What are calamari? <laughs> what kind of what are they? What kind of food is calamari? Calamari is also octopus, but it's probably it, a different form. Yeah, oh, it's a different mm -hmm. form, but they're very conscious. Mm -hmm. um, squid, so, squid, squid. I so. Now I don't think it's squid, but it's something else. <coughs> it could be squid. Um, but anyway, so it's about how do we how do we remember and put back together? Okay, the the, the net, Indra's net, if you will, of connection between us and the animals. I, you know, I've been told that, that if you own land, that plants will come to you that you might need. They'll just migrate right into your yard um, yes, if you need something. Do you know what I mean? Mother okay. Earth and all of our relations are so willing and ready. As Carolyn Casey says, you know, they're all cooperators just standing by. Um, they're all there to come in and um, and help us heal. But we're so intensely hooked up to our machines and to our um, to our really? fake goals, our fake goals of I have to I have to work all the time and make money. That's the Protestant work ethic that has been that was slammed into our ancestors' brains and psyches. And maybe nobody ever told you about it while you were growing up. But basically, it's if you are rich, God loves you. And if you're poor, you're a sinner. And America was founded right around the time of the Protestant Reformation. And a lot of Protestant people came here with that mindset. And, um, and I think part of our trouble with our identity is that men especially men but men and women came to america and felt i have to conquer this land you know i have to tame it and it was so wild and they were so afraid of it because it's big and it's crazy and it's wild and i think that our fear drove us into conquering it more than any other country when i lived in switzerland they loved their earth they took care of their land and people who have lived on the land for centuries and centuries have a connection. They have stories that go with the land that they live on. And here we are all orphans, if you will, coming to America um, and not knowing the magic of the landscape and how to connect to it. So I would say one of the ways you could work with your Mars, you're doing, is go out and talk to the land spirits. 
you know, exactly. uh, connect, connect with your power guides, okay? But go out and like I went out and talked to my marsh. There's a marsh here. And I, um, and we had a great talk and, you know, and she was telling me to cool it because I was getting very fired up about what people were doing about the election. And, um, you know, the landscape has spirits and those spirits will talk to us. And if we can hook back into them, they can, they can sort of help our Mars, I think. Okay. But we, we need to be quiet and silent and, and mm -hmm. listen, you know, exactly. uh, yeah. so we have so much distractions uh, with radios and televisions and computers that nobody knows how to tune into the silence of around us that it's, it's magical. It's very beautiful. You know, I used to, uh, when I get up in the morning to do my ritual, well, my, my meditations and my rituals, I used to put on my, my woo-woo music and it's now like, uh-uh, it's time to hear what's out there, who's talking, the birds, uh, the crows are hawking. I have a squirrel just right outside my window over my altar here in my bedroom that comes by and visits and, and my cats go crazy and I go, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> It's beautiful, you know, silence is beautiful. People don't know how to no. react. But you to know, that's one of the things with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. As I've said, Mother Earth said, you're all been naughty, go to your rooms. And even though we're, you know, in the house and, and doing computers, it's much quieter than it's ever been. And think about the masks. The symbol and then the air has be been quiet clean. and listen. <laughs> and the air had been clean when it first started. Yes, you could see the sky. Yes. You know, there was no no pollution out there. You could it was breathe. wonderful. It was go wonderful. You know, and, it's just beautiful. And, and people are afraid of change. And they're afraid because they want to know what the future is going to bring. But we all know that first you have to have a lot of chaos to and wreck everything so something new can get born. And if only we could help people understand that, they wouldn't be so afraid, so angry, so frustrated, because those are the negative expressions of Mars. Anger, frustration, you know, domination, aggression, competition, rather than protection and, and um, adventuring and being inspired and being passionate and all those good, yummy um, ways we can express our Mars. So there's so many wonderful stories. And, and as I said, if I was looking through all my fairy tale books, but most of them are about, about the feminine because that's been the biggest issue during patriarchy. Patriarchy has rejected the feminine part of life. And so it's always the feminine trying to come back and help the masculine. And so, um, and that goes for men and women, but it also goes for the masculine and women and the feminine and men. Um, the, the divine feminine is life and masculine is, and the, the, the divine masculine is meaning. What does this life mean? Together, the masculine, a straight line, the feminine, a circle, together, a spiral. When you put them together, um, it's, a, it's an energy of, of transformation if you can work it. So that's, I think, is our job and our calling right now is to heal the masculine in society and in ourselves. And that means for women, be the wild woman, you know? Don't, don't do what you're supposed to do if that's not what your heart wants you to do. Um, for the men, trust your feelings, you know? Ground your doing in your being. So I see it as a very positive time and, um, and with a lot of potential, even though it feels like it's crazy out there. And there's just so much, you know, you listen to the news and there's so much war and there's so much destruction going on. Um, and it's so interesting because of course the masculine energy is very outgoing, whereas the feminine energy is inner, right? It's like our sex organs, okay? The men go out, the women are in. Um, but, you know, I was listening to a news story about um, Armenia and one of the other Kazakhstans or something having a war. And I was thinking, everybody's society is falling apart. 
nobody, ha it's not just America, but everybody's roads and institutions are falling apart. And yet they would rather look outside and fight with somebody rather than just say, let's have a big time out, everybody. We have a pandemic, go into your rooms, go into your own country and build something positive. And I think that's an important part of what we need to do. Well, Why do we keep what looking that outside? That pandemic was all about. That pandemic yeah. was to, to take us, uh, to wake us up in, in a way that, you know, we have to kind of come to ourselves. So many people are afraid of thinking about themselves, you know, that they need these distractions out there so they can think that they have a life going. When actually what Mother, what Mother Earth, the Pachamama is saying is, I think it's time for you to kind of like wake up a little bit, find out what's going on or it within yourself and around the world. And it's not like it's not applying just to the United States. It's the global thing. That's what Capricorn, Saturn went into Capricorn, Jupiter in Capricorn, and Chiron, um, uh, Chiron in Capricorn all are doing the same. We got to get a uh, wake up, wake up and grow up. Grow yeah. up, you got to see. Time you to grow up and to wake up. Yep. Yeah, look at your shadow and deal yep. with the shadow, you know. So our think. shadow Mars is the bully, okay? Our shadow Mars is the dominator. Our shadow Mars is toxic masculinity that thinks it's better and that the feminine is less than. Partnership, masculin partnership masculinity is when you listen to the feminine and then you act. It's like all of our native sisters and brothers up in um, with the um, pipeline. It was the women, it was the grandmothers who said, this is the black snake, we have to stop it. And all the young warriors went, we're there, we're gonna go and protect you. Um, how so, about those women? How about those women on the election day, they got on those horses and they went riding down the plain in the country. Wasn't that just beautiful? Oh, that was the most feminine, warrior energy that i ever read and saw oh my god sisters go for it i only wish that i was there with you to be able to ride that 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 horse bareback with you but i honor you i honor you for yeah. doing so you're 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 expressing yourselves you're saying this is what's going on this is what we are we are the women we are the yeah. mothers we are the nurturers we, we and we can feminine. be warriors and we can be scientists we can be all of it but our essential nature is to listen to what mother earth is telling us we're the ones but more than men who are connected to mother earth yep and yep. we have to be not we have to stop being afraid to speak out i think at least my, it's my experience um throughout many decades i have lived that it's our throat chakra, women's throat chakras have been shut down. And now they're opening up. And now mm -hmm. it's time for us to speak, to speak the truth and not be afraid. With this new beginning and the cycle that's starting, I was hearing somebody, I can't remember who it was, uh, one of the astrologers, I think it was Kapacha, he was saying, or somebody, he says, we're right now, the crown of the child, the cycle that is being birthed right now, is just starting to come out. It's crowning itself and it's having a struggle to come out and it's going to be a while before it is out there. But that's what we're gonna be going through. So, you know, I tell my sisters and I tell my family, do not, have, do not be afraid. Do, don't let the fear that's out there being produced, you know, that's being uh, spewed out in, in, the, in the news media. Have faith, have faith, trust in Mother Earth. Trust in the universe. Trust, just, you know, trust in the magic that's out there. There's so much magic out there that we forgot how to get in touch with it. That's right. That's right. And our job is to listen <coughs> to, to the imagination, to, to learn to work with our creative imagination differently. Years ago, when I was a struggling single mom of four young kids, my friends would say to me, you're so great at dream interpretation and symbols, you should work in advertising. And I went, I would never use my talents to try to sell people junk they don't need. Not going to happen. I'd rather be poor. And so we were. And we did it. You know, we didn't need that. And that's, 
that to me, you know, now that I can look back on it, well, everybody thought, what the heck are you doing, Kathy? I can say, I worked with my inner masculine. I listened to my dreams. I didn't do the thing I should have in some ways, um, but I did the right thing. And that's all that we, it was the right thing for me. It might not have been the right thing for anyone else, but that's one of the, that's what this Mars is. We need to do the right thing for ourselves and not in a selfish way, okay? But in, in, a, in a soulful way, when our soul says, this is where you need to be and this is where you need to go and this is what you need to do, we need to listen to that and not be afraid. Listen so anyway, to intuition and the dreams. I love sleeping and dreaming. I love yeah. my dreams. I love. Them. I love my dreams too. I love them. Okay, love well, them. Um, we're in the moon approaching the new moon, and this is a juicy, powerful time for dreaming. Oh yeah, especially Scorpio. Oh my God, my moon is in Scorpio. I mean, I stayed home today. Thirteen, the number thirteen for the thirteen moons. I stayed home today because I had to be in touch with myself with my, my familiars, which are feminine, are women, uh, uh, girl cats. And it's just that I have to be with myself. I'm not answering the phone. But yeah, this is going to be a powerful new moon. And oh, and I was, I'm so glad that you send out those, uh, those uh, newsletters, Kathy. Yes. I really Thank you, look, Kathy. Forward. I look you. forward to them every time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I will second that. I know I, I always say I'm going to do a short one and then it gets longer and longer. Um, but, but they're beautiful. But I've been a preacher in a lot of lifetimes, so I sometimes I can't help myself. <laughs> okay, well, I think my throat's going, and um, I know we've been on for a while. Thank you all for joining me. This was something that I, I just thought was fun. Um, I'm going to Put it on YouTube and then I'm going to put it up on Facebook if people want to watch it afterwards. But um, thank you. Is there anything else what I really wanted to do? And um, and maybe we'll try to do this another time, maybe after the new year. I really wanted to tell different stories and then I wanted to have people think about it and then get together and start to co-create a new story about the masculine together. Like I've told you old stories about Arthur and Gwen, Arthur and, and we've talked about um, Mars and we've talked about all these things, but you know, what happens when we all come up and start to think about it? And what I wanted to do was play, not quite telephone, but you know, the game when you, when I start something off and then the next person takes it and then the next well, person. Kathy. Yeah. Um, one of the, the things, like, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh will say that there's not going to be a new, you know, leader or a new Buddha, the Sangha, the community is a leader. And so you're talking about stories about heroes. And, you know, maybe this, may, one of the things is uh, it might be more of a collective kind of voice than uh, a singular and I know we, we like narrators or star, you know, main characters, but just a thought. And, and the other thing is keeping things so masculine, feminine, when we're in an era where people are talking about uh, what fluid, gender fluidity, you know, it's not necessarily how I am, but there are, there are other notes playing in, a, in a futuristic tale. But if we don't take apart the masculine and the feminine, we won't know what they are. It's well, alchemical. That's in, al point. in alchemy, you need to separate yeah. out the, the things. And guess what? The feminine is the one that we have that we have ignored. So if we just get all fluid, it's going to end up being towards the masculine because that's what's around. So we need to say this is feminine, this is masculine, this is left brain, this is right brain, and then put it together. But just to go into fluidity gives the masculine the no, power. No, I, I, I'm not saying just to go there. What I'm, I mean, I hear you, and I think that's no, no, a and I, I'm point. not saying you did. I'm just commenting on my thought. Okay, of it. okay. Until yeah, we know, explore it's, what it's the feminine. Until we explore what the feminine is, and re, and name what the masculine is, and really learn to live it, we'll still be stuck in the old mindset. 
in well, we some ways. We definitely need new stories, but we knew that 50 years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. 50 years. So, and, I, and when I talk about heroes, I'm not talking about like one hero is going to appear, but each of us have to be the heroine and the hero, okay? The heroine's journey is the inner journey. The hero, hero's journey is the outer doing, okay? The masculine is the outer, the feminine is the inner. The feminine journey is to go inside and discover all of those qualities in ourselves. The masculine. I think you have to have a stuff. masculine that's very inward as part of, and you do, you do have them on the spiritual. Well, the masculine side. helps you go in and focus, but you still need to go in and do the work, the inner work. So, in that sense, when I was talking about creating a story. You know, in a playful way, like if we were really around a campfire, mm -hmm. and I said, okay, once upon a time, okay, this young man came up, and he came walking through the forest, and with him came his dog and his eagle, and he came upon people sitting around a campfire, and then I would say, Adria, take over the story, and you would say a few things, and someone else, just to be playful. Okay. I think that would be a lot of fun. Playful. I think that would be fun. A lot of it's being, a lot of it is, can we be playful with these old archetypes? But they do need renewal. And, and to me, that's what this um, Mars retrograde is. It's, and also because it's squaring all of those Capricorn planets, we are not only renewing our culture, but we're renewing the archetypes. One of the things people don't understand is archetypes wear out and they become stereotypes. My favorite example is the archetype of the bard or the storyteller. In Celtic, in Celtic societies and in all ancient societies, the storyteller was so important because they carry the cultural um, remembrance. But what's happened to the storyteller? It's become the entertainer. That's a stereotype. But not in indigenous cultures. No, now, right now in our no, culture. No, but, but, but in now, the, this, there must be griots that are, are talking and they're happening. They're not ancient. Yeah. They're, but you know, I'm talking so, about as a society, okay? What we value as well, a society. I think, I think we're not, we're not I, I think that our focus on, on Caucasian stuff sometimes distorts our our sense of possibility. Of course and, it does. Of course okay, it does. But, okay, so maybe when we go and do the story, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, one of the things that Lauren Spears says, she's, she uh, is the director of the Tamaquag Museum of, of, for the Narragansett people. And she says, people often think of us as like from the past. You know, she says like, you know, our people are very much alive now and, and it's, it's interesting to me, the more I hear about her sense of the ancestors. You know, as a Jew, I have lots of sense of ancestors. She has a different sense of ancestors. Right. So. And the thing is, if we could do that and have a different sense of ancestors and incorporate all of that, like I didn't, I was going to tell Native American stories, but one of the things I heard is you have to ask permission of if you okay. can tell their stories. So... I didn't want, I didn't, you know, I have some, I have tons of books, but I don't have permission. So I didn't feel like I could tell Native American stories um, because I, that's what I've heard about their storytelling. I'm just saying that, mm. that all the archetypes need renewal. Okay. And I just picked the storyteller or the bard as an example. In our culture, the storyteller who influences our psyche, especially Hollywood, with all the violence that they've put into our psyches, has been relegated to, be, it's, a, it's lost its energy and it's just a stereotype now. It's an entertainer rather than a teacher. That's why when, a, like my favorite is Robert Redford, but when he says something, I listen because he tells good stories and I see him as a bard. Mm -hmm. But most storytellers in a, on a collective level are just trying to entertain us. So that means the archetype itself, the energy has left it, okay? The archetype of the storyteller in a cultural, in our Western culture. Okay, so in a Eurocentric right. culture, okay. Yes, but uh, in other cultures, they're still there in Africa, I'm sure, in India, in all over. 
It's just mm -hmm. our culture. We give it to Hollywood or TV. We don't have neighborhood storytelling. We don't sit around and well, tell stories. We do. And that's why. We do. Like in Rhode Island, there's a whole. People. But I'm not disagreeing with you, Kat. No, no, I'm no, really I, know. I know. I think I think you're right in a kind of essential way. I oh, I see someone's going. I gotta go too. I, I do too. So anyway, thank you all for Big coming. love, everybody. And um, happy um, new moon, happy Thanksgiving, or whatever mm -hmm. you want to be celebrating. And um, we'll see what happens. I'm gonna start right. the recording. And, and Kath, I, I really.